one of my favorite leaders had told me maybe eight, seven, eight years ago that a great product leader wakes up in the morning and reading, reads the newspaper. And I was like, what does that even mean? Who even reads the newspaper? That's a term that has been thrown around, I think, to a point that it's been overused. Justice happens when you not just give kids the access to the tools, which is ladder, equal size ladders, but you're also propping up the tree on one side with, with sticks and you're pulling the tree from the other side with ropes so that the number of apples on both sides are equal. It's not just the shoes of the customer when they are using your product. It's used with the shoes of the customer around the clock. I, I jump out of bed to work because I feel like I'm a warrior for my customer. And that only comes when you're living in the context, you're walking in the shoes. To walk in the shoes of the customer, you first have to remove your own. Hey there, this is Carlos, CEO at Product School and your host on the Product Podcast. Today's guest is incredible. Her name is Prashanti Ravanavarabu, Product Executive at PayPal, one of the largest fintech companies in the world. Prashanti has held 10 different roles at PayPal over her 17-year tenure. She's been recognized as one of the most influential women in fintech and is celebrated for her authentic, supportive, and collaborative leadership style. In fact, nobody who's worked with her has ever left her team voluntarily. Under her leadership, PayPal has seen remarkable growth. In the first quarter of this year, PayPal's payment volume climbed 14%, reaching over $400 billion. Prashanti has also played a pivotal role in building best-in-class products and experiences that enhance the financial health of underserved communities. During our conversation, we dive deeper into navigating internal mobility successfully, how product teams should think about the user journey beyond understanding what the users do within their products, what is justice-driven product design, building high-performing teams and hiring for mindset over skill set. Welcome to the show, Prasanti. Thank you for having me, Carlos. So you were a shot putter growing up. Um, so as a former athlete, I am very curious to learn, first of all, what is a shot putter, but also how that experience helped you become the leader that you are today? Yeah, yeah, great question. Thanks for starting there. A shot put is really one of the field events in track and field. It's actually people throwing this big, heavy iron metal ball to the furthest and the person who, you know, throws it to the furthest wins. Um, and interestingly, it's not the most very popular sport, but one of my growing up, one of the coaches I was training with thought I would be great. And I, and I, I became a shot putter. Uh, that was my main event. And I spent most of my high school and college time training six to eight to 12 hours a day to being a, to being better at shot put. But I was also training as part of a broader track team, which consisted of different kinds of people. And from that whole experience, two things have stuck with me. One, that, you know, talent is everywhere, but opportunity might not be. Because a lot of the people on my team actually didn't have access to uh, money, healthy food or anything, but they would still show up to train with absolutely nothing to eat, but would train just as hard as us. That was one. And then the second thing that stuck with me was the amount of training you would do to succeed. And then a lot of us would fail, but we would get back, start all, start all over again for the next year and how it actually makes us very resilient. So I bring a lot of that um, endurance and relentless uh, nature throughout my career. And I see that as well. And the empathy for people who don't have access to opportunity also is stuck with me. I love that. And I, I've seen a lot of athletes, immigrants, veterans, and other different categories succeeding in business because of that resilient mindset. Not to say that that's the only way you can acquire it, but definitely I think there's a lot of connection between applying this to sports and applying this to business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I see you've spent over 17 years at PayPal. You mentioned you've been in how many different teams or how many different roles? Yeah, and so, yeah, I'm at 17 years and three months. Um, I've done t six different jobs, but under the six different jobs, I've done 10 different roles. What that means is, you know, and I've worn hats from being a business systems analyst to a product manager to being in merchant, uh, uh, mergers and acquisition. I'm part of a design organization. I was a human-centered design coach. 
I was a product architect. But at the end of the day, the way I think about it is all of these roles really just help me be better at problem solving. I'm a problem solver by nature, a product leader by craft and change maker in spirit. And that just describes me. And that's what I've been navigating, finding, okay, what are the biggest problems that needed to be solved? What hat do I need to wear to solve that problem? So I go after that and that ends up becoming a job. That's about it. And that sounds great. I think practically, as, as I try to land this concept for other people who might be considering internal mobility, how can you, how did you do that successfully in a way that is not just good for you to get a promotion or more visibility, but also show a case where this is actually good for the business? Yeah, a great question. I think often people focus on internal mobility for promotion. But actually, if you if you forget that and if you focus on what's the business value you can deliver for the business and what's the customer value you can provide for the customer, actually building a business case for a role becomes easier. And maybe I got lucky because I was in an environment like PayPal where internal mobility is very well supported. But my formula was really simple. It was I was always assessing at, at, at the at this Venn diagram of identifying what are I, what are my unique strengths. What are the interests that I'm interested in an area to learn or area to have an impact or whatever that might be? And then the third big circle I would look at is what's the gap in the business? What Because you, let's say I might be interested in working on world hunger, but PayPal is not the relevant place for world hunger. But PayPal is very relevant for financial services. So in that context, you have to think about what's the gap for the business that you can solve by applying your strengths and following your passions and interests. And you find that intersection, actually building a business case is not that difficult. And you'll find leaders supporting you in making that transition into a role to solve a problem that others are not able to solve. And that's what's really worked for me. So you identify this opportunity for the business and, and for yourself. You make the business okay. case. And then what? How do you actually, like, who do yeah. you pitch it to? And how do you navigate yeah. an order? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So... Pitch is not always for one person. So I actually had curated a couple of different roles for myself at the, at, Pay, at, uh, at PayPal. Uh, I can give you one example of being a product architect. You've never heard the title. It was never formed before. I was the only product architect and I will probably be the only product architect ever. But for that role, the way I approached it is I had to look around the corner and look ahead and see where the industry is going where we should be focusing on to be able to innovate. But then to do that, a lot of others might not see that like you see. So which means you need to bring people along that journey. So it meant talking to a bunch of leaders about the potential, the opportunity and so on, getting their input and keep building on the case. And then I would pitch to any leader who would listen. But at the same time, I have to look at what's the relevance. I can go pitch a product idea, let's say, to a tech leader. Right, I can pitch a tech problem to a product leader. So I had to identify and literally map out who, which leaders will be relevant or interesting and then meet and greet them, build the trust, show my credibility, show the past successes and show what I can do through actually building out not just the business case, but the potential. And that meant I actually had to do the work before, like writing a peer FAQ or whatever, to go meet the customers, build the business case, talk about what uh, in, uh, investment might be needed, what the ROI will be and so on. And then sometimes actually pull up the sleeves and actually do a MVP of some sort or show some concepts or whatever. That way leaders actually know that investing in the idea, the role and me is good for them as well as the business. And then eventually some leader will take the bet and say, oh yeah, you know, come over here and do it. And for me in that time, actually, I ended up pitching to a bunch of leaders. I ended up creating the role in a social innovation team, which typically at most companies is the corporate social responsibility team. But in this case, it ended up being a product innovation team. And being in that social innovation team, I was actually leading discovery and coaching for a lot of the product teams at PayPal too. That's, I think, a good example of how you can make things happen for yourself at your company. Well, let's talk about social innovation, social impact. That's sometimes considered a secondary topic for some organizations, yeah. right? So how do you connect the, the, the purpose with the profit? Yeah, what a great question. I think we end up 
over imagining what purpose means. Because when we talk about social impact and purpose, a lot of the images that come to your mind is maybe, you know, a hungry kid or like really desperate situations. That is true. But also we have to know that every product has an has an inherent ability to have massive impact by doing two things. One, we can all, we can at the minimum ask ourselves, are we creating any harm through our products? Can we actually not create harm? That's the basic we can do. The next level we can do is actually look at what is the potential social impact we can have. And, and the model, the framework I have in my mind is, you probably have seen this again, Venn diagram where of product managers who work at the intersection of user experience, business, and technology, right? It's three. I actually add another cycle, a circle to it. And the fourth cycle is actually looking at social impact. What that means is don't just look at what the gap in the industry is, what the business you can build, what's the user experience and how you can leverage technology, but also look at how can you be more inclusive? Is there a communal uh, problem that exists? Or is there a large scale problem that exists that you can tackle through your product? So that Venn diagram becomes actually at the intersection of four. And then I believe product and tech uh, technologies not just become great product managers, they actually become radical change makers because they're bringing it. And I also think you, I don't think we have to think about balancing between profit and purpose because the most successful companies actually will see radical success when they're not having to balance, but they go after impact. A good example I can think about that I learned from Clayton Christensen writing in The Prosperity Paradox is Tolaram. Tolaram is a successful example because it's a business. It was a noodle business in Singapore. And they started exporting noodles to Nigeria. And you would not think how a noodle company can actually bring infrastructure, education, jobs, and actually increase the GDP of the country. So now Tolaram's uh, Indomie noodles are ubiquitous in Nigeria. And that didn't happen because Tolaram only focused on profit or only focused on purpose. They actually made it all together and they actually built a great business out of it. So if more businesses can do it, then I think there's no more a question of balancing. It's actually inherent in how everybody does business. And this reminds me of the concept of the missionaries and the yes. mercenaries, right? Famous Jeff Bezos okay, right. talks about it. And Every company that I've been part of, I always credit it with a deep sense of purpose. Like there's something beyond the business that I'm trying to accomplish. And I noticed that that doesn't always resonate with, with people. And, and it's easy to forget sometimes or for some people who are motivated by other things to, to not prioritize the mission of the business. So I'm curious in your case, as someone who's been leading teams on the scale, how do you think about mission? Yeah. And when I talked about building missionary teams, that's what I, I mean as well. Building missionary teams actually has a, a couple of things you have to think in mind. Not everybody might be driven by the big mission, right? Maybe they don't want to be world changing. They Maybe they don't want to end global poverty. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think any human being will walk away feeling like I'm not a good person. Everybody wants to be and feel a good person. You can speak to that basic human nature. And what you'll also see is like how Daniel Pink talks about, um, you know, drive. Drive is at the intersection of uh, uh, purpose, mastery, and autonomy. So while everybody might not be motivated by a mission, they will be motivated by a customer. When you end up having a PM meet a customer, you cannot walk away not wanting to solve for that customer. So mission doesn't have to be something big. It has to, it can be something as simple as, Hey, I want to solve for Joe, or Jamina, because I've met them. I've seen their struggles. I want to solve for them. And then you add on to that, this concept of, hey, by doing it, I will also help you learn great skills so that you're becoming mastery, master of the skill and you're becoming excellent at it. Then you get motivated by building a great career for yourself. And then on top of it, add autonomy, which is I'm empowering you to do all the great work on yourself. And all of that actually unlocks career. So because everybody will be motivated for a better career. And if you weave in this sense of, oh, I'm actually doing good work, then you end up creating pride in them too. Those are the ingredients which I feel like I see unlocks uh, and unleashes talent in people. And I see them becoming these missionaries working on teams. I think that's such a great point. Like the mission is not always the mission of the company. And like, I think as yeah. leaders finding what makes someone tick. 
and, and, right. and make it about about that, not just about what somebody else may care about. I think it's it's powerful. In your case, you mentioned before that you led teams as small as two, as big as thousand. So yeah. you know, if you think about in scale in terms of let's say a zero, I would be yeah. curious to learn how do you go about being a manager of individual contributors. What is the next the next threshold and then the next threshold? Yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, one of the unique things I've done in my career here is I've been great at starting stuff, zero to one to 10, 100 and so on. And for that, what I ended up, ended up doing is go after a problem uh, by myself, sometimes start as an IC and then build it to a, to a broad enough team, a big enough team. And then when another leader is ready to take on, I'm happy to move on and restart my whole journey. But in that, what you see is there are a couple of things that are ingredients that have to be common across. And I think that's becoming more and more relevant in the industry. You can no longer just lead people. You actually have to know the craft to pull up your sleeves, get in there and solve it yourself. Because a couple of things happen when you do that yourself. One, you're very staying close to the craft and close to the details because craft is changing every day. The second is actually you will win a lot of the trust of the people you're hiring and building in your team because they know you know what the real problems are. They don't, they don't believe that, oh, you're so high up that you don't get the problems. So you know that. So that actually benefits for your leader. But as you go up the career ladder, the things you have to remember is when you're working as an IC on your own product, you're really focused on the product. But then as you expand, then your product is a combination of the end product, but also your team, which means you're now inspiring your team versus telling them. You're not writing the docs, you're editing the docs. You're not uh, working with the engineers, but you're helping your PMs know how to better interact with their engineers. So there are the ingredients that change. And then it also will happen that you will lose that frontline management too, and you'll go two levels up. You actually are not even involved with the direct PMs yourself. There are a couple of layers between. And at that point, all you have to do is make sure you're setting the vision, helping make sure everybody at all levels are connected to the vision. They actually know the why and you're removing roadblocks for them. You're creating a learning organization by providing the support and you're helping people succeed. So at any point, you you as you grow, you step in and out of these roles. But you can't forget that at any role or any level, you have to be customer centric. You have to be growth minded. You have to be service oriented. And you have to be proactive. And those are ingredient things for a mindset of a leader at any level. This episode is brought to you by Epo, the next generation A-B testing and feature management platform built for modern growth teams by alums from Airbnb and Stitch Fix. With Epo, you can increase experimentation velocity while unlocking rigorous deep analysis. From setup to troubleshooting to analysis, Epo makes experimentation easy. An accessible UI makes it easy to dig into performance. An out-of-the-box reporting makes it easy for you to avoid annoying prolonged analytics cycles. Check out why companies like Twitch, Miro, and DraftKings rely on Epo. Visit getepo.com slash product school and 10x your experiment velocity. That's getepo.com slash product school. You talk about you can't just lead, you need to do, especially even if you're in a large org, how do you find those opportunities to actually do some of the groundwork and, and show and lead by example? Yeah. So I, like I said, I think I've been lucky enough to find opportunities where I'm able to go after from zero to one. But to get there too, you have to keep looking around the corner, which means you're always... Actually, let me give you this um, example. One of my favorite leaders had told me maybe eight, seven, eight years ago, that a great product leader wakes up in the morning and reading reads the newspaper. And I was like, what does that even mean? Who even reads the newspaper? But what he meant was, what he means is you have to wake up and the first thing you have to do is actually read the trends, read the industry newsletters, things like that. And I was thinking at that point, who has the time for it? I mean, we have to solve all of these problems and we're running, we have meeting, meet, meeting and all of that. But then as I matured as a leader, I understood what he meant. What he means is you set up the team so well to operate on their own that you're not stuck in the operations of the team. You're not stuck fixing the small problems because your team is highly talented and they can solve the problems themselves. 
that frees you up time to actually look around the corner and look ahead because a key role of the product leader is to look ahead and think about areas that nobody is thinking about so that you're leading the teams to a greater visions and greater future uh finding that time means you're investing ahead to build great teams and it it's like a positive cycle you build great teams it gives you more time for deep work you're thinking ahead you're leading ahead and then you're leading the teams that's how i found time and i would always by the way set aside 10 20 25 percent of my time doing deep work and doing going deep into problems but you have to balance that by not going into deep into your team's areas because then it'll show a lack of trust so i end up picking another problem that nobody's on my team is connected and go deep on that that way you stay close to everything as well and that reminds me of some of the things that mark zuckerberg was saying that he's still active in product reviews or in the ceo yeah. of airbnb and like if that's an area of genius for you and it's important for not only for yourself but for your team i think it's good to be connected but the right way of connection without overstepping on someone's shoes correct correct and and you mentioned something about um human centered design being being customer centric that's a term that has been thrown around i think to a point that it's been overused mm -hmm. so i want to learn more about your own experience what do you really mean by by being customer centric yeah see yeah, a great question and you're right there's so many books resources people and there's opposing points of view about how human centered is great but human centered is also not great i think if you remove all of the noise and if you just focus on the word human that's what matters to me and customers are humans so for me meaning being customer centric is really as simple as being kind and gaining empathy for your customer and yes you use the methodology of human centered design on how to meet people how to interview them how to gain insights how to distill the insights and identify problems and all of that but the core is for me to work on anything i need to understand the customer the context in which they're living and operating and the the broader scope of things that they have to deal with because when customers interact with your product they interact with a tiny or a tiny bit of their lifeline but then what happens before what happens after we need to understand that to be better at what we do and then when you gain empathy for your customer the kind of energy you experience in life is just different you don't then see your job as a job you you think about it as like a you you think about it like a crusade um i i jump out of bed to work because i feel like i'm a warrior for my customer and that only comes when you're living in the context you're walking in the shoes and another great quote i remember one of my favorite teachers who taught me human centered design tells me is to walk in the shoes of the customer you first have to remove your own very few people actually remove their own shoes before they try to walk in the shoes of the customer so that has actually stuck with me as well and that i think just helps us be better humans yeah and it's so hard to remove those biases right it's a so, typical behavior is to say well i have an idea I'm just going to yeah. go over there and validate yeah. that yes. idea. Yes. Yes. Oh, so so. Uh, but another thing you you mentioned and I think it's really important as as you think about the user journey and walking in the shoes of the customer. It's not just the shoes of the customer when they are using your product. Yes. It's using the, the shoes of the customer around the clock. So Correct. tell me more about how you actually explore the the user journey in addition yeah. to just the user journey within your product. Yeah, 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 great question. Uh look, I'm not a user research expert, but I've learned a lot and I feel like a lot of people look at me for direction. There are a lot of methods out there for doing user research and learning from the customer, but my favorite one is literally sitting down with customers and following their life. Even that is not whole, like you know, for example, I care a lot about a lot about financial wellness. So I've spent more than a decade trying to understand people's financial behaviors. how they deal with money how they earn save spend budget and all of that and i've done that by meeting like more than 1000 customers in their own life in their homes across multiple countries maybe 11 countries or so uh you would sit there maybe for a couple of hours getting insights into how they operate but let's say if i sit in in the house versus sit, you know meet somebody like this virtually i can actually say if somebody says oh yeah i have these couple of things in my wallet i can say could you show us your wallet and they will show, then you will see them get up walk over 
maybe find the uh, find the wallet on top of the refrigerator or maybe it's locked in the three different boxes or maybe it's just lying on the dining table but then it gives me a question to ask, the insight to ask why is the wallet there what is, what makes it important for you to sit there that's how you learn in the context but then we've also done journaling we had people journal their financial lives over a month and share share with us throughout the month like by texting us when they were whenever it was a key moment we've learned that i've also learned from authors who've written books like portfolios of the poor where they've fall, followed people's lives over a year and multiple years and they've written about it and you learn but for me i think j- following the journey is about following people before and after you they use the product and actually remove your product from the picture completely let's say you have a savings product forget about how they used your savings product actually talk about how they save money what are the behaviors they have before and after and i'll give you one nugget i met people i met this ba- um, man in arizona who saves money with his mother in law that he doesn't really like i met this woman in uk london who saves money into an account that she purposefully forgot password to what did they, those two things give me as insights that they are actually creating friction for themselves from dipping into their savings and wasting it so if i'd only talked about showing them my savings product and how they interacted with it i've missed that whole context of how they need friction so that's how we spend time with people to understand the broader context that you can gain insights to and see how can you inspire your own products to solve for that i heard you talk about gasting driven product design yeah what's that yeah um so it it's actually a concept that really came together with a couple of us working on trying to solve for bias in the system and this really was prompted by you know uh, um a few years back when there was so much racial bias happening and was brought to light uh i discovered this image on the internet uh, and i actually don't know who created that i don't remember who created it but this image of the apple tree uh that has four views of it inequality equality equity and justice in all of the four images what they were showing was uh if you think about just equality what the what you could be doing is giving actually let me set the context of the image the context is there's a apple tree and there are two kids standing on both sides of the tree and on one side of the tree there are a lot more apples on the other side of the tree there are less apples and there are two kids sitting under are uh, standing under both sides now if you think about inequality what it means is you just leave the kids as is and they're trying to wait for the apples to fall of course there are higher chances of apple falling on the side where there are more apples then you go about thinking about equality then what you might do is you might build a product and give them ladders of exactly the equal size because it's equality but then still it's not fair it's not just because one kid has access more access to more apples then you think about equity when you think about equity what you might do is you might build product that's equitable and in that what you mean is you're giving the kid who has access to less apples a taller chair a taller ladder and the other kid with just a you know lower ladder but still the again the number of apples is not solved on both sides so a justice happens when you not just give kids the access to the tools which is ladder equal size ladders but you're also propping up the tree on one side with with sticks and you're pulling the tree from the other side with rope so that the number of apples on both sides are equal so through that what really meant is you're solving for the system and that really sparked the thinking for us in saying okay how can you bring that just justice thinking into your products that way you're not just building products that is inclusive you know equal or equitable but you're actually fixing the systemic issues that create racial bias ethnic bias and all these kinds of bias in the system that is how we think about justice driven product design and as you think about that concept being applied internally for building high performer teams um what's your take on on identifying high potential as well as other people who maybe have more experience uh like as in building teams oh yeah yeah great question it's about building teams i believe that i believe in the concept of be a skill set um is not as important as mindset it really translates to mindset over skill set 
whenever I'm hiring PMs, I'm always thinking about the mindset. And what mindset really means for me is like four aspects. The first is, are they customer centric? Uh, second is, are they growth minded? Uh, third is, are they service oriented? Meaning they're there to serve the customer, then the company, then the team, and finally themselves. And the fourth is um, proactive, like how Stephen Covey says, proactive. And I think in today's industry, a lot of people call it high agency. But it's like you're not waiting to be told. You're leading, you're taking action, you're figuring out things, but you're dedicated to solving the problem. I look at those four as key ingredients to having a great mindset. People with the right mindset will actually solve much bigger problems than anybody with the right skills. And they'll also actually learn the skills because they're growth minded. So I believe that hiring people with the right mindset is going to be much better for the team in the long run than hiring people with great skill sets today. And how do you assess for mindset? And I'm asking, I'm asking because I've hired a ton of PMs as well, and the skill sets, especially the hard skills, are easier to identify. Mindset, yeah. well, someone had talked very well about something, but I don't really know until I see them in action. Yeah, yeah. It's so there's, I don't think there's a magical bullet to it. Uh, it is a lot more nuanced. You can't ask a bunch of 10 questions to know somebody has product sense, for example, or if somebody is data driven. In these, I think you learn a lot from the previous examples. For me, it's about, I, I don't know, I have an internal gauge of people, I guess, but the kinds of questions I ask are slightly different. When people talk about products, pay attention to are they talking about I or we? Right? Uh, are they actually being in, uh, talking a lot more about the customer or the feature? Uh, did they push to fight for a, a, a product that nobody else believed in, but they thought was the right thing for the, for the customer? You can actually think about that. You can also uh, um, identify proactivity or high agency by how people might have examples in their career, how they've found a problem. And they went after it, whether or not it was their own responsibility. Maybe they went and fixed something in another team because they were proactive. So these are these nuanced things that you will find through your interviews. And it's a lot more of behavioral questions, a lot more of 360 feedback. Uh, but the other thing you can do and what product leaders should do anyway is to be continuously mentoring and coaching people in and outside of your company that actually lets you get closer to the people themselves so I end up hiring a lot of people from people I've coached or mentored or others or know through others because you have a lot more closer observation of what they might be doing in, in the concept of mindset. You know, the data point, you mentioned that your attrition is zero. And I've never met anybody who's been able to get to that number. So please tell us more about your secret sauce. Yeah. Well, I think it's... Uh, uh, I have helped people leave my team for other roles because I feel like they will thrive better in other roles than my team. But nobody's actually ever said, hey, I want to quit and leave. And I think it's a combination of a couple of things. One, like b being in an environment that's missionary, but at the same time, they know they're in a learning and growing organization. Uh, all my teams end up being learning teams because I'm learning with them. They're learning with me. They're teaching me and so on. So who doesn't learn? Who doesn't love learning because it know, they know it's going to be better for their career? And the third is I'm actually supporting people in their careers proactively. Uh, what, what that means is I will encourage people to have a negotiation conversation with me. I will encourage my team to practice a promotion pitch with me because I know how hard it is, but I want them to learn while they're with me. So I'm proactively thinking about, hey, how do I get promoted? How do I get you promoted in a year? These are the steps I'm going to take. So I spend a lot of time on that with my people. And I think that just helps people feel seen, heard, valued. And at the end of the day, that's all we all are trying. We all are trying to be seen, valued, and progress in our careers. And if you create such environments where people love working with each other and they're learning and growing and having an impact, I don't think they will want to leave much. Prashanti, you come across as someone extremely wise who speaks in frameworks and as a really well structured mind. So how do you acquire that type of knowledge? What are the, the mentors or the moments in your life that help you get to where you are? Yeah, that, that's very interesting, Carlos, because if you had seen me maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was a do such a doer. 
I have to always do. Even now, I think my family will say I can't sit still. But sitting still is slightly different. I've actually become more reflective and a deep thinker. First, I learn a lot from books, people. I'm reading all the time. I'm reading 50 books a year. But I also read like older books, not the latest ones only, because there's a lot more wisdom there. Now you have a lot more content creators who are creating. Um, so I, I focus on a lot on deep learning. But I also apply that learning because only when you apply, you learn a lot. And then I reflect a lot on how that means and what that means for people, what that means for me. I'm learning from people who are growing early in their career. So I think that just helps me spend time between learning and reflecting. So I believe now in not just doing, but in being. And when you are just being, I think you're able to connect dots much better. Uh, and then finally, I started writing a lot. And when you write, it actually helps you crystallize things into, oh, that looks like a framework there. And then you're translating that into frameworks. I think those are things that have helped me. And I think I got lucky, Carlos. I've had great set of leaders I was learning from, uh, great books that I'm learning from. Uh, and I just am blessed with that. I think you're also a good example of no matter how successful you might be in your career, you're still hungry to learn and you're intentional oh, yes. about blocking time to be, to learn, to write, to do things that might be unrelated to your day to day, but in any way you always find the opportunity to then bring it back and connect the dots. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, the more you learn, the more you know how much you don't know. Right. So yeah, so it creates that hunger. Love it. And I want to leave it here. I think it's such a good way to wrap up this interview. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to spend this time and learn from your experience. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Carlos. Keep up the great work that you're doing for all of the product community.